Oh my god, what are Rick and Ryan up to now? It's time for the Slightly Warped Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Slightly Warp Podcast. We are your Warp Brothers. I am Rick, joined as always with Big Show. Show? What's what, up, what man? Up, what up? How are you? I'm doing pretty good. How was your weekend? Uh, fairly uneventful. Now, oh, just like mine. But those are good nowadays, you know? Yep, the older you get, the, the better you appreciate those. You young folk will get it soon enough. Don't That's worry. right. It's coming. <laughs> so we got a sooner than you soon. think. Very soon. It crept up on us. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. We'll we'll talk about old age in another episode. This episode is dedicated to two specific topics. One of which um we both dig. The other one I know you dig, but I'm slowly getting into because uh all the things that surround it. So we're going to do something a little different. We're going to start off with the sports world because I want to go, over, right. you know, in our continuing uh, adventures of the National Football League. Today, we are talking about the NFC, the NFC. We did that last week, the AFC North. So if you didn't catch the uh, NFC North, check out last week's video. But this week is the AFC North. And for those of you that are football uh, illiterate, that would be the Baltimore Ravens the Cincinnati Bengals, the Cleveland Browns, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. So, show, I want to go over these and get your opinion. Uh, first things first, um, <clears throat> do you remember how they uh, ended last year? Yes. And, uh, and what were your thoughts? Bengals. I th uh, if I'm not mistaken, in order, it was Bengals, Ravens, Steelers, Browns. Um, because I think you're right. I mean, my thoughts on it were the Bengals were the e echelon of that that division, and er and everybody else was playing second fiddle, kind of like in the AFC West. You know, the Chiefs are the top echelon; everybody else is chasing them kind of how it is with the north but, the, but this year but you you made sure to stick that dagger in didn't you well i mean i just it's always there i just gave you a little twist just to remind you but our time's coming you know the king can only can only you know reign for so long everybody that has a time that is true um but this year I mean, just looking at all the divisions, this has the potential to be one of the most competitive divisions in the NFL, I think. I, I won't disagree with you. I, 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 Unlike last week where I felt that there were some clear-cut good teams, teams on the rise, and some clear-cut bad teams, um, this week I don't get that same sense, not even from the hapless Browns. Although, I don't think either one of us are picking them to finish one or two in the division, but that's coming up here. Nah, I'm still going to, I mean, they're still going to be last in the division, I think. I I, I, I agree with that. A matter of fact, I'm just going to jump into it. I, I have the Bengals still finishing in first place. But, I've got the Steelers finishing in second place, just barely above the Ravens. And then the Browns being fourth. What do you got? I mean, it, it's really hard pressed not just to say it's going to be a repeat: Bengals, Ravens, Steelers, Browns. Um, I don't see how Pittsburgh in your in your and I'd like to know more why you think that because they don't have a quarterback. They didn't last year either, but I think yeah, there's something about that defense. Third. That defense started to get really good at the end of the season. Name some players on their defense. 
I know it's hard to name players on an up and coming. Exactly. Defense. It really is. So you don't really know them. And that's, you know, the division last year was trash. So yeah, their defense played decent, but I mean, I'm not saying they won nine games last year. So they're basically 500. I mean, well, they win. A Mike couple Tomlin more has, than... Mike Tomlin has never finished below 500 either. True. True. I mean, but basically they were 500. Uh, they were nine and eight. Um, but you know, are they going to get a few games better? Maybe, but I, th they're going to have a hard time upsetting Baltimore and Cincinnati in that division. I think you're right there, but I think that they're Baltimore also going to get stacked offensively. I think, I think they're going to get the benefit of having a easier schedule, and we'll go over schedules um, in a later date. There, the those the, there's no such thing in division games. Being yeah. an easier schedule because everybody plays everybody. Everybody plays the same. There's only one team on every team schedule that's going to be different because of that extra game. But everybody that Baltimore is going to play, Pittsburgh is going to play because they're in the same division. Now, if we were talking different divisions, I could see that argument. I don't think the the their schedule is going to help them much because they're going to have to play the Bengals twice. They're going to have to play the Ravens twice. They're going to have to play the Browns twice. And, you know, and then whatever, who, who what other, what other, uh, now let me NFC ask you this just off, top of, just off the top of my head. I know we're not talking schedules, but do the Ravens play the Chiefs this year? I don't think so. Okay, never mind then. Because I know the Steelers do play the Raiders, but I don't remember Baltimore being on that schedule. I could be wrong oh, with that, though. I'm going to look real quick while you're talking. Okay. And my logic behind that was, you know, one or two games may make a difference. And when you catch those teams may also make another difference. And, and we are just speculating, of course, because anything can happen. It is, you know, the NFL and, the commissioner is doing his very best to uh, make sure that there's a lot of, um, what do they call it, uh, parity in the league. Yeah, I just think when, you, when you're talking about um, strength of schedule, it's it's really not going to – the. To me, you're right. it's not going to If, compute, if we're talking to, about two different teams in different divisions, divisions, yeah, right. that would make more of a difference. So, no, we do not play the Ravens, and I see you guys do play the Steelers. I think that's a week three matchup, too, or something. Uh, Yes, actually, it is week three, and it looks like it's in Vegas, so it's a home game. Yeah, I'm not really giving home field advantage with this coach and this system and everything, so... But I was just looking. I thought I thought maybe we play. We don't play any AFC North. Oh yeah, we do the Bengals. That's our AFC North guy. The Bengals. See, that's that's the commissioner in action there. He wants the Bengals and the Chiefs to get it on again. And that's Week Seventeen at Arrowhead. See, see, see how that was strategically placed. You cannot or tell Burrow me the Bengals are Depends random. Uh, man, yeah, not after last year. That demon was excised. No, these they're definitely uh they want the best ratings and everything. I get that. Um but here I'm just gonna pick I'm just gonna pick one of these uh AFC North teams. Um well I, we'll just we'll just take the Steelers and we'll look at their schedule real quick. Okay. Uh It looks like they're playing the NFC West. So everybody's going to play the Niners, Rams, Panthers, and Cardinals. And then... I'm sorry, no. Seahawks. Panthers are in the Tampa Bay division. Not know that. It's all good. But they, they start off against the Niners... And then play the Browns, then play you guys, and then the Texans, the Ravens, Rams, Jags, Titans, 
Packers, Browns, Bengals, Cardinals, Patriots, Colts, Bengals, Seahawks, and their final games against the Ravens. That's the Steelers' schedule. Mm. Uh, mm, mm. I, I, I'm going to retract my statement. Then I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to go. Bengals, Ravens, Steelers, Browns. I actually think the Ravens will give Bengals a run for their money for the division. They are they are stacked offensively. And if and if my man can stay healthy. That that's a good point. And I, I think he will. I mean health. Here's the Ravens alone. schedule in order. Here's the Ravens schedule in order. Texans, Bengals, Colts, Browns. That's their first four games. So Steelers tight. Steelers Titans. Lions, Cardinals, Seahawks, Browns, Bengals, Chargers. Rams, Jags, Niners, Dolphins, end against the Steelers. They have a fairly favorable schedule. Yes, they do. I, I, I judging from that, I can give them you know eleven wins easy. And I might as well go ahead. We don't we don't really care about the Browns because we know we just yeah. we agree they're going to suck pretty much. But here's here is the order of the Bengals. Uh, Browns, Ravens, Rams, Titans. That's their first four games. Mm -hmm. Then Cardinals, Seahawks. Then Niners. And then the Bills. Texans, Ravens, Steelers, Jags, Colts, Vikings, Steelers, Chiefs. And they end in Cleveland. Mm. Or... They end at that, home in Cleveland. That's going to be close. I can see 12 wins out of that. So, yeah, yeah one misstep, and you could have the Ravens in first place. But I am yeah. still going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I agree. I mean, I'm going to, I probably agree with you. Bengals, Ravens, Steelers, Browns. That's going to be how I'm going to pick them, you know, on this date. And, and let everybody know that uh, uh, right before the uh, preseason ends, we will be giving updated predictions this is just a pre preseason prediction we're just going around the nfl every week and uh next week we will be in the uh nfc uh east oh, excuse me the nfc south the nfc south the nfc yeah south. but but although i do see i i do see the ravens have an opportunity to upset the Bengals and, and get that division they they do have the opportunity all right <clears throat> That's all we got for sports right now. We will have more in future installments. Make sure that you've got any questions, you hit us up. You can email us at the slightly warped podcast at yahoo.com. If you're on YouTube, leave a comment there. Be sure to like us, share it with everybody so that we can continue to grow and expand. Ryan, my brother. Yes, sir. We are, uh, starting to get popular with unsolved mysteries yes and uh one that you turned me on to <clears throat> called the west memphis three do you want to fill everybody in on uh what that represents uh just real quickly i'll just do a, a quick synopsis back in may i think it was of 1993 <laughs> mm -hmm. uh three uh young kids three kids uh, i want to say they were five six seven eight somewhere in that arena they were young under 10 years old uh anyway they were murdered and three teenagers were convicted uh they were sentenced uh to prison they went to prison in 93 uh and then i want to say i can't it's 2013 ish 2012 ish I don't really recall when they were released. No, it had to be. Let me find out real quick. Uh, let's see, release date. Because I anyway, they were released on the 2000, Alfred plea. 2011. They were yeah, August 19th, 2011. Uh, they they did a what they call a Alfred plea, which was uh, they get to maintain their innocence, but in the court system basically they're saying they're guilty of murder so they served about two decades in prison mm -hmm. and uh this case in the state of arkansas 
uh, is closed, but in public opinion, it's very well a cold case because nobody really believes that these three teenagers actually killed these kids. Okay, my first question, and I'm going to step outside of the case itself. Yeah. Can you go more in in depth with the Alfred plea, what that means? Um basically what it means is that if is I've been convicted, right? Mm -hmm. So basically they were they were convicted and thrown under the jail. Like they had in in the 1990s, you know, DNA testing things like that weren't where it is today. Yeah. Or where it was in 2011 and an alfred plea um is basically me as a prisoner saying that i am that that to the court systems i'm telling you that i'm guilty but i get to proclaim my innocence and still search for the guilty party to bring in front of the court to clear my name legally hmm and okay. and that was and so but also in my mind that was an admission by the arkansas court judicial system that these weren't the killers because if they really thought that these were the three murderers they wouldn't have let them out good point and it also by doing an alpha plea it <laughs> saves the state of arkansas for being sued for wrongful wrongful imprisonment mm, so that works to the prisoner's advantage well it works to the state's well, advantage. to the state's advantage yeah i'm sorry yes yes because you know like in the state of texas if you're falsely imprisoned and you get out and you prove it this state you basically pays you one million dollars for every year you were falsely incarcerated mm. now i don't i don't know what the arkansas um, I'm, I would have to assume it's pretty similar to that, uh, but that's also, like I said, that's that's the way of Arkansas saving, not having to write a check to the three um, alleged perpetrators. Now, I want to just go back just real quick, and you tell me if I'm wrong or right, but of the three perpetrators, one of the boys was actually going to be sentenced to death. One of them got a life imprisonment plus two 20 year sentences. And then the third one was uh, sentenced to life itself. Yeah. So Damien Eccles is the one that was uh, convicted uh, to the death row, served most of his time on death row. And then you had uh, Jason Baldwin and um, uh, Jesse Miss Kelly. They were, that was, those were the other two. Okay. Jesse Jesse Miss Kelly, I believe, is the third one that you described, the one that just had the life sentence. And Jason Baldwin had life sentence plus two twenty years or whatever. I think that's right. Do you know why each successive boy got a harsher sentence? Well, Jesse Miss Kelly was tried separately. Jonathan Baldwin and Damien Eccles were tried together. So there were two separate trials. Jesse's was first. Uh, in the in the whole deal, Jesse Miss Kelly is the one that basically gave a false confession, saying that yes, it was us. You know, he, he seen Jonathan or John Baldwin and Damien Eccles do all these horrendous things to these kids, and but his IQ was like four. I mean, he wasn't very bright. Mm. That's interesting. So that's why. Okay, I, I'd wondered why they got different and sentences. Because, yeah, and and it was different sentences in two separate counties. Even though the crime happened in West Memphis, Arkansas, both, uh, if I'm not mistaken, both trials were in separate counties. And I'm assuming because he confessed his sentence was a little bit lighter. Now, he did not testify against Baldwin or Eccles. He refused to do so. Interesting. Now, I'm going to go back to uh, the first uh, boy. 
Uh He was sentenced to death. So serving that 20 years and then getting free, that had to be, um, I don't want to say vindication, but he had to breathe a sigh of relief because when you're on death row for 20 years and they haven't executed you yet, um, somebody's looking out for you. Yeah. He he could have easily, he could have easily not been one, not been released because he could have been uh, executed years earlier. Yes. But that's where the, you know, the whole uh, appeal process helped, helped him out because again, the, the facts in the case just didn't add up now. Now, now I'm glad you mentioned that because, um, there is a woman named Vicky uh, Hutchison that comes into play mm-hmm. with this. Can That's you tell his us wife, a little bit about correct? her? That's his wife, Damien Eccles' wife. I is that correct? forget whose wife it was. Uh, I know that she was a new resident in West Memphis. And if I'm correct, and I could be wrong, I think her story was uh, fabricated. And it was due in part to, uh, I want to say, coercion from the police. Well, tell me, tell me what you're talking about, because to me, she doesn't really. uh... Let me see if I can pull it up here. Um, All right. Yeah. On uh... she was she was a part of the first trial. Just researching her name real quick. She was part of the first trial with Jesse Miss Kelly saying that, if I'm not mistaken, that. Go ahead and say what you're saying. I'm going to read through this real quick. Well, okay. What I was reading was on the 6th of May in 1993, before the victims were found later the same day, Hutchison took part in a polygraph exam by Detective Don Bray at the Marion Police Department to determine whether or not she had stolen money from her West Memphis employer. And uh, Hutchison's young son, Aaron, also present and proved such a distraction that Bray was unable to administer the polygraph. And um, Aaron, a uh, playmate of the murdered boys, mentioned to Bray that the boys had been killed at the playhouse, in quotes. Uh, And when the bodies proved to have been discovered near where Aaron indicated, Bray asked Aaron for further details. And Aaron claimed that he had witnessed the murders committed by Satanists who spoke Spanish. And... uh, Aaron's further statements were wildly inconsistent and he was unable to identify Baldwin, Eccles, or Miss Kelly from photo lineups. And there was no playhouse at the location that Aaron had indicated. A police officer leaked portions of Aaron's statements to the press, contributing to the growing belief that the murders were part of a satanic rite. Yeah, so back in the 90s, satanic panic was was prevalent, especially in low-income areas in the uh, lighter Caucasian (laughs) areas uh, down South. Um, So this was right in the height of satanic panic. And that's kind of where it went. So basically, um, and to be honest, this lady that you're talking about really had no bearing in, in, in my research on the case. Because she didn't really factor one way or the other, except for the fact that her statement is that if, and this may be a different lady, but you know, overheard Jesse telling somebody that they three did that to, to the, to the young boys, um, which I do want to take the time and actually, uh, throw their names out there too. Um, the, the victims were, uh, Stephen Branch, mm-hmm. uh, Chris Christopher Byers, Byers, and Michael Moore, okay. I believe were the were the three little boys who all went to the same school. Um, so basically, just just rolling this out, what happened was is these kids were out riding their bikes and told to be home at a particular time, didn't show up. They were found. Uh, hogtied in a ditch in this area, which is right, maybe less than two football fields 
behind a truck stop, a pilot truck stop in that area. Now, this whole area has changed, you know, in the last, what, 40 years, 30 years or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, but at that time, it had like a, it was like a creek ditch area and it was full of water and there was a water pipe that you had to kind of walk across to get there mm -hmm. excuse me well they were when they were they were told that these kids went off in those wood wooded area and so when they were looking for the kids and the police were searching for them that's where they found them all three were naked and hogtied with their own shoestrings but basically hogtied with their hands and feet in front of them, right wrist uh, tied to their right ankle, left wrist tied to their left ankle. All of them the exact same. Mm. There were cuts and bruises and things like that where they said there was uh, mutilation, um, um, sexual uh, one of the kids i want to say it was christopher byers uh, his whole penis was removed um but there was no blood in this area zero blood okay and part of the part of the defense was if if we killed these three kids so brutally where how come there was no blood found on either three of the perpetrators right and blood doesn't just wash away i mean it'd be in the ground it'd be around the surrounding areas so to speak but that that's basically the gist of how they found the boys okay so we talked about you know how they found them in the boys themselves, uh, the victims, and the uh, alleged perpetrators. We're going to say alleged. Let's touch a little bit more on whether or not we believe them guilty or innocent. In your mind, okay. where do you stand on this? Um, now, I believe they were that they did not do it back when i was a kid and seen the documentary i think came out in 1998 mm -hmm. uh well no probably 90 yeah it was probably 95 98 somewhere in, i thought that they did do it okay now um i don't have near the knowledge that you have of the specific case just looking at it on the surface though in this day and age right here right now if this were if this had happened first of all it wouldn't even be front page news because so much shit is happening and that's sad to say because there's a different shooting everywhere once a week but i believe that they don't have sufficient evidence to send this to trial for them i mean they would be suspects, but I think they would get off. Well, they had a confession, so they had enough evidence for trial. They had a kid that admitted that, yeah, we was all three there and we did it. I chased one of the kids down and brought him back to him. That's what Jesse's whole statement was. He didn't participate in the killings, but one of the kids broke free. I think Michael Moore, mm -hmm. and he chased him down and brought him back. They had enough evidence for trial. Um, I just don't take that enough evidence for conviction. I see what you're saying. And, and it, it's sad because you said those boys, what, five, around five years old? The yeah, victims? they were, I've, I think so. Five, six, seven, somewhere in that arena. And that is so sad because those children will never even get to live their lives. Just gone. Just no, no matter who did it, it's, it's a travesty because that's three families without their sons and, and and that when you lose a loved one that changes you especially when you lose a child i couldn't even begin to think about what that would do to me i don't know i don't know how i would handle that 
Yeah, like I mean this this case is so big just for us to just to you know we don't have a whole lot of time, but this case is huge. I strongly recommend if you have uh you know the the Max HBO Max thing. There are three documentaries on there called Paradise Lost, and uh, it is it is a three part documentary about this case okay the first the first one is actually the trials and the convictions the second one is um everybody appealing and the different the different uh uh perspectives of the people and then the third is basically all the appeals of motion and then finally them getting released in 2011 on the alfred plea so it basically takes you through the entire process i mean we're not even scratching the service the one thing that i did leave out is that that during the time that they were calling or looking for these people uh mm -hmm. their bojang bojangles is like a, a popeye's chicken here in Kansas city mm -hmm. and they uh there was a vagrant or a homeless man that went into that restroom and was covered in blood. And this Bojangles is like less than a mile from where the boys were found. Mm -hmm. Covered in blood and uh, went into the men's restroom there at the Bojangles. The, the manager called the West Memphis police. Okay. Um, the lady police didn't even come in. She just went through the drive through to the drive through window and asked the manager, is he still here? You know, the, the perpetrator or the person in the bathroom, they said no. So she left, never even went in to look at the, the, the restroom or nothing until, mm. uh, I think they finally went back a couple of days later after the kids were found and, you know, collected evidence and things like that, which was subsequently lost before the trial. Mm. Um, so, you know, there, there. That's always been theory that you know who was this stranger that went into this, you know, to this restroom. You know, could very well have been the killer, and yeah. was going in there to clean himself off. But nobody's ever seen or noticed him or anything like that. Damn, that's that's pretty deep there. But you know, and as you go on through the documentaries, you know, like all the brute, the mutilation and stuff, it comes kind of find out they tend to think it was um because they were under the water for i want to say a good eight to twelve hours roughly before they were found uh, mm -hmm. it might have been a little bit longer might have been a little bit less but you know turtles things like that were chewing on them and eating at them so that's how they think the penis was removed you know the turtle you know but they were saying that it was from a knife and all this stuff um I thoroughly believe it was that person in the Bojangles that was the, the killer. And uh, these kids were falsely convicted. Now, if you watch the first documentary, you'll see why they got convicted. Because Damon Eccles was a cocky little fucker. I mean, he was cocky just thinking that, you know, there's no way that they convict me because I didn't do anything. And he played right into the prosecution's hands. Because he was a little strange. He dressed in black, listened to Metallica, you know, that type of thing. And everybody thought, oh, crap, he does that. He's a Satan worshiper. Yeah. Wow. That, that is really, it, it's an awful thing. And it's at the same time, it makes you think. It, it, it really makes you think. Because um, for those of you who may not know, if you check out a previous broadcast, uh, we, we did one. Uh, a previous uh unsolved mystery and this has the same effect on me because you know my wheels are spinning i don't know what to believe i don't know which way to go on this um and, and it's sad that if the real killer was out there he would never be found now and if these boys did it they got off eventually one way or the other uh well they're not they're tech i mean yeah they're out but they didn't get off on it uh i mean because if let's say that there's some evidence the problem is is that the arkansas judicial system isn't looking for new evidence 
Right. But let's say something came up and it proves that these three boys actually did it. Yes. They would get thrown right back in prison. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But as you said, they're not actively looking. And that's one of the sad things. Um, And, and it's a cold, hard fact anywhere you go in this country. Um, the system is designed to be quick in and out. And if uh, it goes on too long. It's sorry, we can't do anything else on to the next one. Um, that cookie cutter mentality. And if we if we spend more time on something, um, we might get a better result. But that's yep. neither here nor there. I do want to ask everybody out there, what do you guys think about this? And show one more time before we get out of here. Tell them again where they can find these documentaries and the name of it. It's on uh, the HBO Max streaming service. I think it's just called Max now. Uh, but it's it's on there. It's called Paradise Lost. And you'll find them. It's three documentaries. Um, both the, All three are probably a couple hours long. Uh, strongly recommend. I strongly recommend you to check them out. Maybe we can go back and readdress this case in a further episode when you're more up on the case. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Joe. It's been another good one. Yes, sir. All right. Take us out of here on a positive note. On a positive note. Yes. Love each other. Give each other lots of loves. Because as we were just discussing, tomorrow isn't promised. So like, subscribe, tell your friends. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. He said it better than me. See ya.